I talk about maintaining spiritual momentum. You know, whenever you have a spiritual high, it's a natural response to say, let's stay up on this mountain. Let's stay in this revival. Let's stay in this meeting. Let's stay excited about this. Well, you can't live life on a constant high because life is this way. It's ups and downs. It has ebbs and flows. You know about that. The Christian life is not a 100-yard dash. The Christian life is a marathon. And so in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, it's about being motivated not to give up when you're not on the spiritual high. It's about saying motivated to maintain the momentum spiritually that's been generated. Now look at verse 1 with me in Hebrews chapter 12. He says this. He says, since we have such a huge crowd of men of faith watching us from the grandstands and women of faith watching us from the grandstands, let us strip off anything that slows us down or holds us back, and especially those sins that wrap themselves so tightly around our feet, and they trip us up. How many of you have ever been tripped up? Just a few of you. How many of you ever been tripped up? I thought so. Lying will get you in trouble too, you know what I mean? Let us run with, what's that next word? Patience, the particular race that God has set before us. See, we all have our races. My race and your race is different. So we all have different races, but he says, run your race with patience. Then read on. It says, keep your eyes on who? Keep your eyes on who? Not the president, not the governor, not the sheriff, not the pastor, not the elder, not the teacher. Keep your eyes on who? On Jesus, he says. Notice that. Keep your eyes on Jesus, our leader and instructor. He was willing to die a shameful death on the cross because of the joy he knew would be his afterwards, and now he sits in the place of honor by the throne of God. So let's look at this passage of Scripture, two verses, and, and I've, I found there's more than this possibly, but I found five principles, five important things that we need to do that will help us maintain the spiritual momentum. If you know anything about a car... You might know what an RPM is, the revolutions per minute. When you rev a car up, the revolutions increase. And you get, you hit it hard, and the revolutions go. Can you run a car at 9,000 RPMs the whole time? Can you do that? Now, if you don't know anything about cars, let me tell you, you can't do that because what will happen is you'll blow the engine. And so when you run a car, and it backs down, and it backs down. That's just like us as people in our walk. You can't live your life at 9,000 revolutions all the time. There's going to be an ebb and a flow. Sometimes the tide is out. Say that with me. Tide is out. Say that with me. The tide is out. And sometimes the tide is in. But how do you maintain that consistency? Well, Hebrews tells us how to do it. Here's the first thing. The first principle is this. Find strength from those who have gone before us. Find strength from those who have gone before us. Write that on your outline. You see, the scripture gives us guidance here. Those who have gone before us. I want to tell you, all of us here, we're standing on somebody else's shoulders. All of us here are. There's some people that have gone before us that helped set us up where we are today. I wouldn't be here today if there was not some guy from South Florida that I happened to meet when I was in my first year of college, a guy named Jess Page. He took me, discipled me, mentored me. I don't think I'd be here today if it wasn't for a guy named Jess Page. It's crazy. We all stand on somebody's shoulders. And so the Renewed Church is standing on the shoulders of people, men and women who have made sacrifices, who have prayed, who have gone well before us. When you visit the campus of LSU, you see some mighty, mighty large oak trees. I mean, there's some majestic trees on there. Whoever planted those trees never saw the majesty and the beauty and were spent time under the shade of those trees. You know what I'm talking about? But you know what? We're enjoying the bounty of their labors. We're all standing on somebody's shoulders. Now, what does that do? Well, it means that we need to be grateful for those in the past, and also we need to plant some trees for the future. We need to plant some trees with renewed church that are going to bless people 30 and 40 and 50 years from now that we'll never see. People that are not here yet, we need to plant some trees for them. You know what I'm saying? So here we go. The Scripture says what? It finds strength in those who have gone before. The verse of Scripture in there says, you know, we have such a huge crowd of men and women of faith watching from the grandstands. 
Hebrews chapter 11, the chapter before 12, is an all-star team of Christianity. It's got a long list of names of people that you may be familiar with or not, and about what they did with their walk, their unswerving faith in God. They never quit. They wouldn't walk away from their commitment to God. They were ridiculed sometimes. Sometimes they were mistreated. Some actually died, martyrs, for the cause of God. And what does it take to do that? It takes perseverance. If you want to grow in your faith, if you want to have perseverance, if you want to hang around uh, to, to maintain your spiritual minimum, you know what you need to find? Let me hear what you do. You find somebody that heats up your passion for God. Find somebody that you can spend time with that motivates you and stokes you. Now, back in the day, I used to play basketball. You look at me and you say, well, you look, you're built like a football player. In fact, you're built like a football when I look at you. <laughs> well... Back in the day, I was, uh, you know, I, I tell people, you know, New Orleans, when I lived in New Orleans, New Orleans was good for about 40 pounds. Lafayette's been good for about 80 pounds. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Ooh, I'm telling you. But back in the day when I played basketball, there was a guy named Andrew Tony. Andrew Tony was from Birmingham. He went to USL and played at USL. And then he played for the Philadelphia 76ers with Dr. Julius Irving. Andrew Tony. Phenomenal. Played in NBA several years. Great shooter. He was awesome. Well, after he retired years ago, we'd go to the gym and play pickup games. And, and whenever Andrew Tony came and played ball with us, oh, man, you talk about picking up my game. Andrew's here. I don't want to look like a slum. I need to bring my game up a level or two. And he just motivated me to do better in the pickup games. That may sound stupid to you, but it was not motivational. I mean, if Coach O came over here and hung out with you, would that kind of motivate you a little bit? I mean, think about that. Just say, oh, Coach O in the front row over here, would that kind of fire you up? All you got sitting on the back, you become sitting on the front because you be close to Coach O. You get around, oh, he motivates you. And so what we have to do spiritually is find some people that motivate us, that crank us up, that pump us up, that stoke us up, because that's what helps us. So what's the principle here? Find strength from those who've gone before us. And not only do we need to find somebody to help increase our passion for God, we need to do that for some other people. Who are the junior people around you that you can motivate and crank up and coach up? We need to be passing it on. So if you want to sustain that passion, hang around people who are on fire for God. Who is that person in your life? Don't answer out loud, but who is that person in your life right now that, that motivates you to be a stronger believer, motivates you to be more of a God person, who motivates you more to share your faith? Who is that person in your life right now? Who is it? If you can't think of somebody, you need to find somebody. Okay, now I know everybody can't hang out with Nicole, all right? I mean, she can only handle so many. But you need to find somebody that you can spend some time with that will motivate you. That's number one. Number two, you want to maintain spiritual momentum, you need to do this. Put off the things that trip me up. Put off the things that trip me up. Look at that scripture. This is verse one. He says, let us strip off anything that slows us down or holds us back, and especially those sins that wrap themselves so tightly around our feet and trip us up. You know, in virtually every kind of athletic event, having excess weight is not good unless you're a sumo wrestler. <laughs> excess weight as a sumo wrestler is a good thing, but for a track star, a running back, for a speedster, it's not good. Now, what is it that weighs down the believer that hinders their spiritual momentum? Well, here's what you need to let go of. He says, he says, strip it off, get rid of it. Here's the first thing. You need to let go of the ungodly. Write that word, put it down on your blank, on your outline. Let go of the ungodly. What does that mean? That means let go of sin. We know the sin hinders our growth, but we don't let it go. We have our pet sins, and you know what? We, 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 you know, we, just, we just like them. We coddle them, and we pet them, and we don't tell nobody about them, but we got our little things we like. Well, I'm going to be this way. Nobody knows, but I'll be okay. We need to let go of those ungodly things. So let me ask you, is there some area in your life today that the Holy Spirit is calling your attention to? Is there something going on in your life today that the Holy Spirit's pointed out, but you're still turning a deaf ear to the Holy Spirit? Maybe it is an addiction. Maybe it is some deceitful business practices. Maybe you're entertaining some flirtatious relationships. You're married 
But you say, I still got game. <laughs> I still got it. I said, when you're around there, when your spouse is not around, you know, you, you got the walk, you got the jive, you got it going on. I still got, hey, I still got it. I still got it. You know that's not a God. For you who are married, now if, you, if you're looking, you got to throw the bait out there. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, hey, baby. But for you guys that are married, you ladies that are married, you don't be flirting with somebody else. Oh, no, you got to let go of the ungodly. Let it go. So if you're going to strip the things off, you're going to get rid of the excess things that, that keep you from being all God wants you to be, let it go. The second thing is to let go of the unnecessary. Let go of the unnecessary. Now, what, what do you mean by that, Pastor Mike? Now, this is it's just a little more subtle because it's not necessarily sin. It may not be a moral compromise, but what it does is it still keeps you weighted down from spiritual progress. It still hinders your spiritual growth and progress. It could be something as simple as letting your life get so full of other things that you have no time, that you have no energy left to pursue the things of God, to pursue your relationship with Christ. It could be this for you guys who are parents. You are so busy because you have your children in six or seven different curricular activities, and you don't have time to do nothing else but get them in the car and go from here to there to here to there to here to there. And you're exhausted. You're tired. Isn't it funny how we'll put our kids in the car, we'll drive 60 miles to play a soccer game, we'll go 100 miles to get in a dance competition, we'll go to Disney World and compete with cheerleaders. We do all this kind of stuff, but the pastor says, hey, can you come on Sunday morning? Oh, pastor, I'm too busy. Hey, pastor, I got too much going on. Isn't it funny how parents will do all kinds of stuff for their kids, but they don't commit to giving them the religious training and spiritual stuff that they need? It's like pulling teeth when you talked about somebody being committed to church on Sunday and being in a small group, growing together. You know, oh, hell, we're so busy. It's like this. Do y'all have a, uh, an Olive Garden restaurant in Baton Rouge? Have you know you ever been to an Olive Garden restaurant? I need, I need some help here. Okay, you've been there. You know what it's like. So you go in and you order your entree. I want me a big lasagna, or I want me some of that chicken, whatever they call it, put on it. You know, I want a nice meal here. And so you put your order in, and then all of a sudden the, the, the wait staff comes back, and they got a big basket of bread. <laughs> Come on now. Come on. Say bread with me. Bread. They bring that bread, then they bring that salad that never stops. Oh, you need some more of that uh, uh, rabbit food? Come on, put more salad in there. And so what you find yourself doing, you're hungry, you're waiting on your entree, and you're eating breadsticks. And before you know it, you done ate nine or ten breadsticks. <laughs> you're piling them in because they're good. Aren't they good? Say, Brother Mike, they're good. <laughs> then you hit the salad. Oh, that salad's good, yeah. Man, and you're there, and you're, you're, you're loading it up, and, and it's all free. It's free. It's complimentary at that point. And then they come out with your entree. Chicken Marcella, or lasagna, or skeddy, or whatever it is, and they put it in front of you, and you look at it, and your eyes kind of bulge out, and you think, man, I can't eat that. I'm full. I'm full. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Now, look, there ain't nothing wrong with eating bread. There ain't nothing wrong with eating salad. But if you're so full of that easy stuff that you don't have time for the main course, you done messed up. So you pack it up in a doggy bag, you take it home, it gets cold, you leave it in the refrigerator for three weeks, it makes penicillin, and then you throw it away. <laughs> I've done that. You ever done that? I've done that. Here's the problem. You got filled up on the small junk stuff, and you have time for the main thing. This is what we do spiritually, folks. We get our lives so full of activities, and they're good at nothing wrong with them. Nothing wrong with dance, nothing wrong with piano, nothing wrong with football, nothing wrong with soccer, nothing wrong with, with chorus and cheerleading. We, but we fill our lives up with all that stuff, all that stuff, and then when it comes time to put in some of the things of God, we ain't got no room because we're tired and we're full. Y'all know what I'm talking about? I've experienced that personally. So when he says let go of the unnecessary, you need to look back at your life 
and see, are there some things that I'm filling my life with that keep me from getting to the best thing? There's got to be time for spiritual instruction in our lives. So, what have I said so far today? Number one, I said, find strength from those who have gone before us. Number two, what did I say? I said, put off the things that trip me up. Now, we're talking about maintaining spiritual momentum. Here's number three. <clears throat> oh, I left out my scripture, 2 Timothy 2.3. Excuse me. 2 Timothy 2.3 says, endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs because he wants to please his commander. When you sign up for the military, you get rid of all your civilian distractions that will keep you from being the soldier you should be. When we sign up on God's team, when we become a Christian, we need to get rid of all the distractions that keep us from being the kind of woman or man of God that God wants us to be. So here's my question for you. Don't answer out loud, but you think about it. You can even write it down if you want to. What do I need to let go of? What are my breadsticks? What are my sa what's my salad? What is it keeps me from giving it to him? What is it you need to let go of? I mean, it's bad necessary. Well, if it's ungodly, yeah, but if it's just unnecessary, what do you need to let go of? Number three, the third principle is this, is choose to persevere until I cross the finish line persevere till you cross the finish line now verse 1 says this look at verse 1 of Hebrews 12 let us run with patience the particular race that God has set before us now folks greatness is never or excuse me greatness has been defined by the ability to persevere and to overcome obstacles anybody who's great has paid a heavy heavy price for it you know folks used to watch Tiger Woods play golf and they see he was so smooth, he was so good, he, he killed everybody. He was so great. But they never saw all the hours and hours and hours that he practiced. The same thing with any other sports. Guys who are phenomenal paid a price. They worked at it and worked at it and worked at it. You don't see the work, but when the work's put in, they are stellar. And it's the same way with our spiritual faith. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, 58. He says, therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Stand firm. Paul says this, you make a decision in advance that you're going to be steadfast. Make a decision in advance that you're going to be immovable no matter what hardship comes your way. Because hard days will come. You know what I mean? Hard days will come. There will be some valleys. There will be times in your spiritual life when God seems distant. When things don't make sense. It's going to come. If it hasn't arrived yet in your life already, it will come because we all go through it. It's not in those times when you're under the, when you're encountering that situation. That's not the time to decide if you're going to follow or not. You decide now, and when that time comes, is you've already made the decision. I'm hanging in there. I'm staying on this thing. I'm not giving up. I'm not quitting. The author of Hebrews says, do not turn back. Keep pressing on. So let me ask you today, what is it that God wants you to keep on doing? What is it that you need to persevere with? What is the area in your life that you need to keep on keeping on? You need to hang on to it. Don't quit. Don't stop. I have a saying. Not my plan. It's God's plan. I'll understand God's plan later if I don't understand it now. But it's not my plan. It's God's plan. So I'm going to hang in there because one day I will understand. That's number three principle. Number four principle, keep a single-minded focus. <clears throat> keep a single-minded focus. You know, what do you mean, Pastor Mike? Well, you can't keep your eyes on other people. You can't do it. People let you down. Say it with me. People let you down. Let's do that again. People let you down. So you can't keep your eyes on other people. You can't keep your eyes on other churches. You can't do that. You can't compare a new church to the other churches in town. You know, they got all kinds of churches over here. All kinds of churches. But you got your church. You can't be like, a, see, as I drove in on the interstate, that, that Astruma church. That ain't y'all. Y'all regular. You know what I'm talking about? We regular people over here. 
Just kidding. I know Pastor Jeff. He's my friend. In fact, by the way, Pastor Jeff's last day today. He's out. He's going to South America to be a missionary leader. But you're not a Struma. You're not Parkview. You're not, uh, you know, this, this is not, uh, I can't think of the name of Swaggart's place. But anyway, you know, this, this is not those churches. Y'all are y'all's church. Y'all are who you are. And you can't compare yourself to other churches and say, well, we need to be like that. No, you need to be who God created you to be. And this is a special, special place that reaches special people. I tell people in my church all the time, I share this with a pastor and your security guard, that everybody at the church I go to, the Bayou Church, everybody there walks with a limp. We all messed up somewhere. You know, have we? I'm messed up. Would you say that with me? I'm messed up. Okay, and if you couldn't say that, you got lying problems too. Well, anyway, <laughs> we all walk with a limp at my church. We all got problems. We all got difficulties, but we want to be real. We want to be authentic. And as a church, you got to be real. You got to be authentic. This is the people we reach. This is the people we minister to. How many of you like to fish? How many of you like to fish? Give me a show of hands here. I like fishing. And when you go fishing, you got to have certain kind of bait. You know, and, and, and bait that people use, if you want to catch, if you want to catch brim, and you'll catch them little fishes, you'll be using maybe a worm or, or a cricket or something like that. And most all churches fish the same way. They fish with crickets and they fish with worms because they're all about the same way. You know, they do the songs and nothing wrong with that. It's just they're all kind of the same. However, when I go fishing, I don't want to use crickets and worms. You know what I want to use? I want to use a topwater buzz bait. That's a lure that doesn't go in the water. It's a lure that stays on top of the water and it buzzes across there. And when you fish like that, you get some big bass or some big red fish. You don't get them little bitty brims. You know what I'm saying? Brims are okay. I want a red fish. How about you? Yeah. Four or five pounder make me feel good. This church, the Renew Church, is not a cricket and worm church. Nothing wrong with that, but that's not y'all. Y'all know what y'all are? Y'all are buzz bait. You catching a fish in the Baton Rouge area that nobody else is going after. And that's what's special about you. And that's what y'all need to be. Look and feel good about it. You got to feel comfortable in your skin. You got to feel comfortable in your church. And this is who we reach because them other churches ain't touching them. If some of us weren't in other churches, they'd be afraid of us. You know what I'm saying? Ooh, you need to sit back here. You don't look like us. You don't smell like us. You don't walk like us. You need to sit over here in the corner. But the great thing about Renew Church is you come as you are. You accept it for who you are. You accept it for what you are. And you're loved. So this church, what? You got to keep a single-minded focus. Not be worried about other folks, but do what you do and do it well. Single-minded. You got to have concentration. You got to have intention. You know, in order to do that, you've got to focus on your relationship with Jesus. You've got to focus in on him. You've got to build your relationship with him. You've got to make some time to be with him. You've got to slow down long enough to be with him. You've got to create space in your life to be with him. You've got to have moments in the day when you can be with him. You've got to have time alone where you can be with him. You've got to have undistracted presence in him so you can be with him. And in those times, you replenish. And in those times, you nourish your very soul. And without that, you're not going to make it. you got that single mind, your single focus. Anybody here been married 20 years or longer? Hold your hand up. Okay, good. That's a lot of you. God bless you. Now, when you're married 20 years or longer, it ain't like it used to be, is it? In some ways. You remember when you first started dating that sweetheart? I'm telling you, you couldn't get enough time with them. I'm telling you, when you sit in the car, you'd be sitting side by side by side. Now she's hugging the door handle, staying away from you. Woo! You'd be writing him notes early. You'd be calling all the time. They didn't have texting way back then, but you'd been texting all the time. That's what they do today. Man, you'd be singing them songs. You'd be hanging at their house. You won't be doing things. You'd be hanging out just because you want to be in the presence. Have you know what I'm talking about? I mean, when you first uh, started dating your true love that you've been married to 20, 30, 40 years, I mean, you were on fire, weren't you? <laughs> now, you still got the fire. It's just a little different. Just a little different. You see, what we must do as a believer 
is we got to go back to, to talk about nourishing that spiritual relationship with Jesus. We got to go back like it used to be sometimes when we had that unbridled passion and love for Jesus, when we do whatever he wanted us to do. That doesn't mean you don't love him now, but it means that you don't want to lose that focus, that single focus. Jesus, I live for an audience of one. That's the attitude we need to have. I live for an audience of one. My wife's number two. Jesus is number one. My wife's number two. Or your husband should be number two. Jesus needs to be number one. Because if he's number one, your number two is going to be awesome. (laughs) Do I hear hallelujah? (laughs) Sorry. I'm getting a little excited up here. I need to hold it down a little bit. I forgot. I'm in a sophisticated church. Look at Philippians chapter 3, verse 8. What is more? I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ. You know what Paul says in that verse? Paul, here's what he's saying. He's saying this, that there's nothing more important than pursuing a relationship with Jesus Christ. Nothing. So my question for you is this. In order for you to stay single-minded, what will you do? What will you do to stay single-minded? Fifth principle. What's the fifth thing? This is a tough one. We don't hear much about this in church. You know, we hear a lot of good stuff, but we don't hear too much about this. The fifth thing is this. Endure the suffering to see the smile. Endure the suffering to see the smile. That's Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. He says this. He was willing to die a shameful death on the cross because, it's talking about Jesus, because Jesus knew the joy that would be his afterwards or of the joy he knew would be his afterwards. Jesus is the example here of someone who kept an eternal perspective. He looked past that suffering. He looked past that beating. He looked past that crucifixion. He looked past that flogging. And he looked to the Father, and it gave him joy. Endure the suffering to see the smile. You know what he's saying to you and me? There are times that we go through suffering. There are times that Christians, people say, well, once you get saved, you don't have any problems. That's not true. Ooh. Can you say with me, I got problems? Say that with me. I got problems. You got some? I got some. In fact, I'll give you some of mine. That make me feel better. We all got problems. All of us go through suffering. So here's what he says when you go through suffering. He's saying that we need to regularly lift up our heads and look toward the finish line. When life gets hard, when the race gets tiring, look up and see your heavenly father. Your heavenly father's out there cheering you on. Now today, some of you are going through a really difficult time. Some of you are going through a hard time, and you're wondering, where's God in all this that I'm going through? I thought if I love Jesus, I'm going to be okay. Where is God in all of this? Well, I say to you today, my brothers and sisters, that don't you quit. Don't you give up. You keep going on. Keep one eye on heaven and keep pressing on. If the devil knocks out all your teeth, gum him to death. Whew, that's some deep theology right there. Gum him to death. Ain't quitting, ain't stopping, ain't shutting it down. We pressing on. And it's hard. It's not easy. It's hard. It's hard. It's hard. I shared with Pastors Checkers and Nicole yesterday. My second son uh, died about 21 months ago. I was believing God for a miracle, believing God for a promise, and, and it, it didn't happen. I was believing God for a testimony of a prodigal coming home and bearing testimony, but it didn't happen. I'm telling you, it's been hard. Wind was taken out of my sail. But I ain't given up on God. I know one day, I know one day that I'm going to understand, I'm going to see it, and I'm going to see what God has done here. And I know where my boy is, but it's been hard. But you know what? I ain't quit. I ain't giving up. Because we do have hard times. We do have difficult things. But we look up and we see him. I got, I got a couple of great verses I want to share with you. It means a lot to me and it's going to mean a lot to you, I think, if you're going through hard times. Look with me at Psalm chapter 17, verse 15. He says, because I am righteous, I will see you. Talking about God. When I awake, 
I will see you face to face and be satisfied. Say those two words, be satisfied. Say it again, be satisfied. I don't understand now, but I know one day I'm going to be satisfied. And I say, oh yeah, I get it now. Philippians chapter 3, verse 14 says, I strain to reach the end of the race and receive the prize for which God through Christ Jesus is calling us to heaven. You know, you and I can go through the present troubles because we know one day, one day the pain is going to be gone. One day the tears are going to be wiped off our face. We know one day relationships are going to be restored. And we know one day that we're going to be with our Heavenly Father and we're going to be satisfied. I am able to endure the present because I know that someday I'll be with Him. How do you know that? I know that because I've invited Jesus Christ into my heart and my life. You know, if you're not a believer in Christ, I don't mean just a mental knowledge. I'm talking about a heart commitment. If you're not a believer in Christ, you don't get these benefits I've been talking about today. You don't get these blessings I've been talking about today. You don't get that help. You don't get that hope. You don't get that courage. You don't get that strength. And you don't get that knowledge of knowing that one day it's going to be okay. You don't get that if you're not a follower of Christ. So my friends, if you're not a follower, let me encourage you. You don't have to be able to cross every T, dot every I to come to know him. You just come as you are, and then he reveals himself to you. He comes into your life, and he changes you from the inside out. That's what he does. And so I would encourage you today to commit your life to Christ. And today's message of some of the wonderful benefits, not all of them by any means, but some of the great benefits of being a follower of Christ. I want you to bow your heads with me for a moment. I'll give you a chance to pray that prayer. I want you to pray silent in your heart this prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, I realize that I need you in my life. And I don't understand everything, but I ask you to come into my life. Forgive me of my sins, and I turn to you. Help me, God, to understand and help me to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. And by faith, I'm just stepping out and giving it to you. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for me. I love you, Jesus. I want to love you more. In your name we pray. Amen. Now look, if you prayed that prayer and invited Jesus Christ into your life, you're a new person now. You're a believer. It's a whole new start. All your past has been erased. It's all gone. And you got a whole new future ahead. And that's the exciting thing. And you need to tell somebody about that. You need to let some people know. I'm going to give you a chance to do that in just a moment. But I'm going to wrap up what I've said today. Now, what do you say? You talk about maintaining spiritual momentum. How do you maintain spiritual momentum? You find strength from those who've gone before. How do you do it? You put off those things that trip you up. How do you do it? You choose to persevere till you cross the finish line. How do you do it? You keep that single-minded focus. And how do you do it? You endure the suffering. See the smile. That's how you do it. 